So as you heard, we are starting a brand new series in the book of Exodus, The Rise of Moses. So we're going to be hearing a lot about him. And so we're going to get a little grounding right now by reading the entire first chapter of Exodus that will set the stage for our message today. So you can follow along in your Bible or we'll have it on the screen. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. excited for this new series. I love the book of Exodus. I think it's fantastic. It just has so many um, amazing stories in it, things that are really foundational to our faith. And you're going to see as we go through just how significant it is, it is to our faith even today. Uh, all of the parallels for our faith and our salvation, our freedom that we have gained in Christ that relate to things that go right back into this book of Exodus. We're going to see all of this. So I'm really encouraging you, bring your Bibles to this series. I, I, I want to encourage everybody to just start doing that. Bring a paper Bible. Remember the stuff, paper? Remember this? Bring paper Bibles to church, mark in it, take notes. It's really, really valuable to your learning, I think, as you do that. Um, just mark up your Bible, and uh, I think you're going to find this is very, very beneficial. Uh, let's talk about Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible. It is also the second book of what we call the Torah, or the law, or the Pentateuch. Pentateuch meaning those five first books. The name uh, Exodus is actually taken from the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which was exodos, uh, which means a going out. It's playing off of what happened, this main storyline of uh, the children of Israel leaving Egypt. But the original title in Hebrew is actually the word Shemot, which means names. Now, why would it be called names? Any ideas? Why in Hebrew is the book of Exodus called names? Pastor Barry knows, I know he can tell. If you read first one, look at verse one. This is why you should have your Bible in front of you. What does it say in verse one? These are the 
names of the sons of Israel. Very often in Hebrew writing and in the books of the Old Testament, the name of the book is the first word or the first, taken from the first phrase of the book. That's how they remember uh, what it was. And so that's why it's called Shemot in Hebrew. It has long been understood to have been mainly written by Moses. <clears throat> Other Bible writers confirm that, including one uh, really important person named Jesus, who also uh, referred to Moses as the author it is what we call historical narrative, meaning that it presents facts about history, things that really happened. And the book is dated, um, well, let me tell you, but it's a little bit tricky, kind of nailing down the date when it comes to some of these books. There are not a lot of internal clues when you read the book of Exodus. You kind of have to look at clues outside of the book to figure it out. We do learn right away that the Hebrews built the cities of Pithom and Ramses. That's internal and that the length of their time of slavery was 430 years. So that's helpful, uh, but we don't get a long list of genealogies in the book of Exodus like we do in other places, like in the book of Kings, for example, where it will list all of the different monarchs. We don't get that in Exodus, so we have to look in other places. According to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it says that the Exodus took place 480 years before the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. That is very helpful. And that actually helps us date the book of Exodus for 1446 BC or the event of the Exodus. <clears throat> Recent research uh, works with that date and it would place Thutmose III as the pharaoh over the time of oppression um, leading up to the Exodus and Amenhotep II as the pharaoh of the Exodus, the infamous pharaoh who would not let the people go but ended up letting the people go and his name would be infamous as a result of that. And so those are common names associated with that date. Another possible date could be 1290 BC, which would align with Seti I and Ramses II being the pharaohs who oppressed and then also uh, allowed them to leave in the Exodus respectively. Archaeologists have also found evidence of widespread Canaanite destruction in the 13th century. That would align with Joshua invading at that time after the Exodus. And so that's something else that archaeologists take into consideration. Either way, whichever date you prefer, the events are to be taken as factual. As time goes on, we find more and more in archaeology that kind of helps us to nail these things down specifically. But we can be confident that these are factual things. The theme of Exodus is the fulfillment of God's promises to the patriarchs, even in the face of very unlikely odds. And when you think about the situation that the Hebrews were in at this point, to see that God would release them from slavery in Egypt in this way is really quite a remarkable thing. And so the book is really about a God who remembers his promises, punishes sin, and forgives the penitent. That's how the ESV study Bible words it. It's also a book that highlights the faithfulness of God's servant, Moses. And so in this section, we're talking about the rise of Moses. There are some key themes that appear. Again, I took these from the ESV study Bible, and these are things to watch for. The first is the offspring idea, that God is going to fulfill his promise of multiplying this people for himself, a promise that he made to Abraham. We're going to see this happening right in the very beginning as the numbers multiply here. The promise of the land, that God would lead his people out of Egypt into a land that's flowing with milk and honey, this land of Canaan. We're going to see that. The theme of blessing is here, that Israel would become a holy nation, actually a sign to other nations of the goodness and power of God, starting with the Egyptians themselves. You're going to see later, you know, in chapter 12, verse 38, it actually says that when the Israelites finally exited Egypt after that final plague, did you notice that it says that it was a mixed multitude that left? Meaning it wasn't just the Hebrews that left in the Exodus. A number of Egyptians and people from other places left with them. So already they were being a light to people around as God saw, as people saw God working through them with all of these amazing signs and wonders and the plagues that they could see the power of God and already people were joining with them at that time. We have this idea of a covenant mediator. This is Moses who would be the mediator of this covenant with Israel, between Israel and God. And then this covenant presence, God's presence that can be seen throughout the book, superintending the development of this nation. We see it right from the beginning with this burning bush experience that Moses is going to have. We see it um, on Mount Sinai, right, with all of this lightning and thunder and so on as Moses, they are the mediator 
with this covenant. We see the covenant presence meeting him there, God himself. We see God's presence being revealed even to the different leaders. And later on, when they would go out into the desert through this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. And so these are all big, important themes to be watching. This is a very brief introduction. I would encourage you to do more background study on the book of Exodus. You'll find it to be very interesting. In terms of the story itself, let's introduce this. The children of Israel who came to Egypt during the time of the famine when Joseph was second in command in Egypt. You guys remember the story? Hopefully. Uh, These people have now multiplied to a great deal. And now the promise that God made to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 15 is going to be accomplished. And this is amazing when you go back and you remember the promise that he made. Take a look in Genesis 15. The Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. What what land is that? Egypt, right? They will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. And we know that they pillaged the Egyptians as they were leaving and took great wealth and gold and so on with them when they left. And so as much as anything, this book is really about the faithfulness of God, his faithfulness to his word, his faithfulness to his people, and we're going to see God's faithfulness. So keep in mind all of these ideas as we're going through. This series on Exodus is actually going to be four mini series that we're going to be doing. And so we're actually going to be covering like I say, four different major topics. We're starting with the rise of Moses from here to chapter seven. Then we're going to get into the deliverance of Israel. We're going to talk about all these plagues and everything that happens there under Pharaoh. We're going to see lessons once they get out in the desert. And then finally, the giving of the law. And we're going to go through chapter 24 uh, of Exodus. So that this series is going to go through chapters one to 24. And we're going to be covering a lot of stuff. We're going to run right through the summer with this. We're going to go right up to our fall kickoff. And so as per usual, during the summer months, we're going to have a lot of guest speakers, which I know is always enjoyable. So stay tuned for that. We will read most of the chapters in our scripture reading. Uh, Sometimes we won't be able to read all of it because they can be fairly long. But we won't be working quite as tightly verse by verse as we had in some of our New Testament books that we've worked through recently. Um, The narrative tends to be longer in the Old Testament and it's looser. It's kind of written in a different way. New Testament writing is in Greek and it's precise and it's doctrine that's, you know, we're, we're kind of supposed to slow down and break it down more. This is more to get the story, so we'll be moving through it at a little quicker pace. Along with refreshing the story, we want you to walk away every week with some really practical lessons. And here's a really cool insight as we get into this Old Testament historical narrative like we see in Exodus. The nation of Israel often serves as a prototype for the believer, and lessons that Israel learns often apply to individual believers today, right? So that's a really important thing to grasp. And I would say not just lessons that they learn, lessons that they fail to learn. (laughs) They apply to us as well, because often with the Israelites, it's more about what they're failing to learn, but that applies to us. Some insights will actually have national or even cultural implications. You're going to see that even today. But try to see what God has to say to you through the text that we're reading, all right? Really think about what is God teaching me from what I'm learning through these amazing stories, stories that have lived through so many ages and have been just, you know, at the top of all of our literature that we've studied. Let's start with chapter one. So we heard it read already uh, by Pastor Merrick. The book begins by listing the brothers of Joseph who came down into Egypt with their father Jacob during that time of great famine. So I encourage you, as a little bit of a background check, go back and just read the last few chapters of Genesis and remember the story of what happened with Joseph, how Joseph was this precocious young guy who his brothers were jealous of because he had these visions from God. And so what happened? They sold him into slavery, right? He had that coat of many colors. They threw him in a pit. The Egyptian slave traders come by, they sell him as a slave, and he gets sold down into Egypt, right? Remember all of the story? He eventually works his way up to second in command under Pharaoh, and he basically saves the nation of Egypt from famine because of what God did through him. And so refresh that story. Also remember here when it uses the term Israel, 
and Jacob, that's the same, right? Israel was re, uh, Jacob was renamed as Israel. It's talking about the same person. And it was those 12 sons of Jacob that are now forming this nation of Israel. The 11 sons of Jacob are all named here in this passage. It says that uh, Joseph was left out because he was already there, as we know. But we know the story of how they came down into Egypt. They were scared to death, right, to re-meet their brother that they had sold into slavery. And when you see the 11 sons listed here, you may not realize it, but they're listed in a specific order, if you check it out. The first six, from Reuben to Zebulun that you see there, those are Leah's boys by birth order. Now, you remember that uh, Jacob's first wife was Leah. Remember, Jacob got tricked. And so his first wife was Leah. He had six boys by her. That's the six boys in order. The next one that is mentioned is Benjamin. He's one of the two sons that came from this wife that uh, Jacob really loved, which was Rachel. Joseph, of course, was already in Egypt. So that's why Benjamin is mentioned next. Then Dan and Naphtali, they are the sons of Bilhah. That's Rachel's maidservant. If you remember the story, Jacob had sons by her, and then Gad and Asher were the sons of Zilpah, and that's Leah's maidservant. So there's actually a rhyme and reason to how even those sons are listed here in that passage. And it says here that they started out with 70 family members in Egypt during this famine. So when they started out, their families go down there, there's 70 people. That's what we're starting with, 70 people that form this nation of Israel at the beginning. Joseph and his generation die off, it says, and the family multiplies from there. And in verse 7, it actually hints at Moses' understanding of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, when God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth. Because he uses that same language here. He says, this is what the Israelites did. They were fruitful and they multiplied and they filled the land with their people. So Moses saw his people, the people of God, as acting in accordance with that command way back in Genesis. Do you see the connection? Remember, Moses, he believes in all of this. He was the one that wrote this, who received this word from God to write for us. Now, a little bit of math would probably be helpful. And if you're doing math in Egypt, you need an abacus, right? Wah, wah, wah. That's funny. All right, a little math. 70 people, if you start with 70 people and approximately 400 years of slavery... That is about 16 generations if you're counting 25 years per generation, all right? Now, we see in Exodus chapter 12, we're going to get there later. At the time of the Exodus, it says that there were 600,000 men plus women and children that left Egypt. So that's probably well over 2 million people that came out of Egypt in the Exodus. That's a pretty safe estimate. And just so that you know, that's very easy to arrive at. Even with short lifespans, even in a life filled with slavery, right? And child mortality rates and all of that kind of stuff. Two million people would actually be very easy to arrive at over that period of time. All right, so just in terms of math, think about this. If everyone was paired up, you take those 70 people. If everyone was paired up to marry among that 70, and every couple had two kids what would the net increase in population be over 400 years? Anyone? The net increase would be what? It would be zero, because if you're just having two kids for every family, for every pair of people, the net amount over that time is going to be zero. In any population, if families are only having two children each, that population will never grow. You know that, right? Okay, so you need to have more than two kids if you're going to increase those numbers? That was a bit of a trick question. I'm just making sure that you're awake, all right? But if you increase that to three kids, guess how many people you come out to over 400 years? About 21 million, all right? So the whole population having one more kid over 400 years makes a huge, huge difference. Now, obviously, not everyone married, not everyone had kids, many would have died early deaths, and so two million actually makes perfect sense when you're looking at how many people came out of Egypt. Now, on a different level, that command to multiply and fill the earth, I want to take a pause here and just, you know, think about this a little bit. It's interesting, even politically today, and when you think about certain things that are going on in the world, this command going back in Genesis chapter 1 to fill the earth is applicable to this story, and it's applicable to even things going on today. 
in our world. You know, for years in China, the one-child policy helped curb the population, a population that was kind of multiplying out of control. So the authorities thought at that time. But now people are starting to understand the devastating impact of that decision. Maybe some of you have followed this in the news. Besides the creation of huge amounts of gender inequality by that policy, because most families were having boys and not girls, it threatens to affect much more. The rule, which started in the 80s but was scrapped in 2015, has become hard to reverse now that the Chinese want to reverse it because people are used to small families now, and economically, it's harder to afford larger families, especially when you've gotten used to having small families. Now, it's kind of crazy. Most people don't take the time to think about this, but those that come from that part of the world are familiar with this. If you're growing up as the only child in a family, what's one thing that you don't have? Brothers and sisters, right? And someone brought this up the other day in one of the venues where I was. We got talking about it. If you don't have brothers or sisters, guess what else you don't have? Aunts and uncles, right? So if you grew up during that time in China, you're not used to having brothers and sisters. You're not used to having aunts and uncles. And so people that come from China to this part of the world and see all of this, these big families that people have, that's kind of a strange thing to them. And kind of an enriching thing when they experience it for the first time, if you can imagine. Think about what it would be like to have no siblings, no cousins, no aunts or uncles. It would be kind of strange. Well, current UN estimates, and these are conservative, have China's population falling by 100 to 200 million people by 2050. That's a big dip in population. And you can see here in this graph, this is showing the 65 plus crowd in red growing as the 15 to 64, which is your working population decreases and somewhere about 50 to 60 years from now one is going to overtake the other there's going to be more people that are too old to work than the number of people who can now any anthropologist sociologist they know this is not a good situation it's a really dire kind of situation experts are commenting on how an aging population with not enough younger people coming up is going to place a huge burden on that younger generation the workforce is shrinking there won't be enough people to care for the elderly. And people ask, how will China's social security system manage with fewer workers to fund things like pensions and health care? How are they going to do that? It is a huge question. E economic growth forecasts have actually shifted significantly for China as a result of these realities. Whereas a number of years ago, it was just like China's going to take over. Now people are going, ooh, this is a big problem. Some may remember that Elon Musk recently tweeted, population collapse due to low birth rates is, as much, is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. Now, I don't know what you think of Elon Musk. I think comparing the problem to global warming didn't make him a lot of friends. <laughs> I think Elon Musk doesn't care, uh, if you know anything about him. But he is a very intelligent man, and he's actually got a lot of experts that agree with him on that point. It is a huge problem for China. Virtually every expert agrees that this population collapse is a big problem that needs to be addressed. So here's the point that I'm making here. And this relates to scripture, you know, very directly. When God tells us something as a human race, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, right? He knows what he's saying and his motivation is always love, right? God didn't create the world and then give us instructions to destroy us. He gives us good instructions that are healthy for us and good for us. Now, it's great to be environmentally conscious, but it's very easy for us as humans to think that we're in control, and we have to be very careful about that, because we're not. God is in control of history, and nowhere in the Bible did he ever tell us to watch out for a population explosion. Did you know that? There's nowhere in the Bible where he says, watch out. If you guys multiply too much, you're going to doom your planet. Never says that. He says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That's what he says. You say, but, but God, you don't understand. <laughs> now, once you get to the point of saying, God, you don't understand, you don't understand, right? So it's just something to be aware of. And this is where we, you know, we believe the Bible by faith. Sometimes we don't see the reason behind God's, you know, decrees right away. But you're always going to see it at some point because what God gives you is truth and it makes sense. 
Well, we see here that the Pharaoh is oppressing Israel. In verse 8, we see this really telling phrase, a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph comes to power. Now you might read over that really quickly. That's a very significant phrase. A new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. Exodus is so rich. I would encourage you guys as you're going through this series, check out a couple of things. Uh, on Daily Wire, if you're subscribed to that, um, Jordan Peterson is actually doing kind of a round table on the book of Exodus with a bunch of very intelligent people. And it's extremely interesting. It's very heady, and Peterson tends to be very sort of, um, you know, very mythological in kind of his approach to things, but it's still very interesting. and some good stuff you can get out of that. Uh, also, Dennis Prager's Rational Bible, the, vol the volume on Exodus, um, would be a great thing to check out. He's Jewish, and he's going to give you stuff from a Jewish perspective, but he has some really great insights on the book of Exodus. He actually participates in that roundtable with Jordan Peterson, but Exodus is getting a lot of attention right now. And it's kind of cool. Um, a lot of academics and for good reason. There's so many lessons that are built into the story and things that have a real bearing on our life today. Here's another lesson that we learn from the book of Exodus. And that is the danger of forgetting your history. That's what we see in those words, a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. This is the danger of forgetting your history. And this is what we see in the story. As George Santayana once said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That was reworded by a number of people. Irishman Edmund Burke said it. Winston Churchill said it. Usually they say those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. It's the same idea. We need our kids to learn history. Amen? Yeah, we, we need to know history. Because if we don't, we're going to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So many people today are prone to swallowing whole some very destructive ideologies because they haven't studied how those ideologies have been applied in the past. Because the new Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, he lost an appreciation for what Joseph and his people had done for the nation of Egypt. He forgot who Joseph was. He didn't remember that Joseph literally saved their nation by the power of God, by this dream that he had, by storing up grain for seven years to prepare for seven lean years. Now all he could see was the threat that these Israelites pose. Here's what he's thinking as a ruler. You know what? We're a big dynasty. People are going to try to attack us at some point. When they come to try to attack us, all they got to do is go to these slaves that have multiplied. They're more numerous than us. If they get them to flip, we're done. We're in trouble, right? So he's thinking like a leader who's trying to protect his people. And so that's all that he can see is they might somehow want to gain their freedom. And so what does he do? He tries to act wisely, the passage says. That's the Hebrew word hakam. But he actually does the opposite of acting wisely. He sets taskmasters over them and he works them hard. He gets them building entire cities for the Egyptians. The city of Ramses was found actually in Kantir, 19 kilometers south of Tanis, and Pithom is believed to have been 27 kilometers southeast of Ramses. So you can see where those are on the map as it relates to Egypt today. Pottery fragments found in a pottery factory in Ramses actually bear that name. They've found the name on the pottery. So these details align very well with the text of Exodus. Contrary to popular belief, the pyramids appear to have been built centuries before this, not by the Israelites. So for those that heard, the Israelites built the pyramids, probably not. That's not what we see in history, but they did build entire cities under slavery. Um, difficult forced labor. And the more Pharaoh oppressed them, it says here in this passage, the more they multiplied and the more they spread across this region. You can imagine, we, we know how population growth is here in the GTA, just new neighborhoods all the time. This is how it was there. It was just spreading, Israelites growing, multiplying. They're slaves, but they're continuing to grow. Pharaoh's approach is just to continue to double down and to put more hard labor on them, thinking that that's going to accomplish something. Well, it wasn't. And so he gets to the next strategy, and that is infanticide. He's like, we just got to start killing them. This is the only thing that's going to subdue this population and eliminate this threat of them turning on us. So since the Hebrews were slaves, 
They were also used as midwives for the Egyptians. That's one of the ways that they were used as slaves. And the Pharaoh instituted a new practice, and by practice I mean law, that Hebrew boys needed to be killed. Now here's a little insight. If you fear being taken over by a certain people group, right, through war, what do you do? You kill the boys. It's just kind of a logical thing that you would do. And that is what the Pharaoh decides to do. We're going to kill all of the boys. And it's interesting. They put the burden of this infanticide on the Hebrew midwives, particularly two top prominent ones. It's kind of interesting because that's a lot of people for these two midwives to be responsible for. They obviously weren't doing all of the work. They were obviously in some form of higher position. Um, Think about it. If there's 2 million people that we're talking about here, let's put this in context. Montreal is close to 2 million people. And if you know anything about Montreal, you study it out, you would find out that there are about 40,000 live births per year in Montreal. That's about 100 babies a day in rough numbers, all right? So these women were not doing all the delivering. They were higher up over people that were delivering babies, but they were people of influence. And these two women had a lot of prominence in the maternity department. Their names were Shifra and Pua. And these two Hebrew women specifically were charged with ensuring that the Pharaoh's orders were followed by all of the midwives. But as you go on in the passage in verse 17, I love the simple statement of their disobedience in verse 17. It says, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Pretty straightforward, right? So in this ancient text, we have a clear example of what we call civil disobedience. We could also use the term disobeying authorities. And this raises an interesting question for us. Have you ever thought about what it would take for you to disobey the government? Have you ever thought about that? I think during COVID, the thought came to more of our minds than it ever did before, right? What would it take for you to say no to what the government was asking you to do and to suffer the consequences of that decision? Would it require fines coming down on you? Imprisonment? Would just the social pressure of everybody looking at you a certain way, would that be enough? What would, what would cause you to do that? Here's a rule of thumb. If the government asks you to do something that is contrary to Christian beliefs, the Bible says that you should graciously refuse and to accept your punishment, right? That's kind of the basic rule for us as Christians. But we could talk about other authorities beyond government when it comes to this. What about your employer? What would it take for you to disobey your employer? You say, well, that's, that's kind of getting personal, right? That's my livelihood now that we're talking about. Yeah? You know, there's some debate here in this passage about whether the midwives were Hebrew or Egyptian. Because in Hebrew, where it says, Lemaya, Ledot, Haivriot, can mean the Hebrew midwives, or it can mean the midwives of the Hebrews. It's actually impossible to tell in Hebrew by how it's written what it means. So you have to go by context. The names appear to be Israelite names, and most Jewish and Christian scholars take it as it is translated here in our text that these are Hebrew midwives. But what does this mean now? What does it mean? If these are Hebrew midwives, what is Pharaoh doing? He's literally getting Hebrew midwives to enforce these terrible rules of killing their own people's children. Think about that. The Pharaoh is trying to get Hebrews turning on Hebrews and doing his bidding. If you think that people in power, even in our day today, will not try to use people to oppress their own fellow citizens, you are very naive, (laughs) right? You don't know history very well. Do any study of any of the great revolutions, and great is in quotes, of Nazi Germany, right? Because here's the thing. People in power are small in number and they have to work through layers of people and they have to work through fear and intimidation. So the only way that you can get it done is to scare the top level of people and hope that they will scare the next level of people and it works down to the whole population. That's how it works. 
Now, we're obviously not in Nazi Germany, but there are ideologies that are being pushed onto the population today by those in power. Most of us understand this, right? You may be somebody that's in a higher level somewhere. Maybe you're an upper level manager. Maybe you're a teacher or a librarian, the owner of a business or a team in some way. I can just tell you this. If you are in charge of people, the importance of your compliance goes way up, right? If you're in charge of people, people on high that have ideologies to push, your compliance is very important to them. And that's why I'm encouraging all of you here today to follow the example of these Hebrew midwives. Fear God ahead of everything and ahead of everyone. Fear God. Do not allow yourself to be a pawn in a battle of ideologies to be used by others. I heard a really good piece of advice for believers recently because there are so many ideologies that are being pushed nowadays and sometimes people are like, I don't know what to do in some of these situations. Here's a great kind of guide. We as Christians don't need to voice our opinion on everything. Sometimes we think that we do. There's a time and a place to, but we don't need to voice our opinion on everything, but we should refuse to do anything that we don't agree with. You understand? We should refuse to do what we don't agree with. The problem often is that even as Christians, we're willing to do things that are going against our conscience. That's a problem. Now, we may not make all of the same decisions, even with that guiding principle. For example, here's one that I'll just kind of throw out there because some of you have experienced this. Um, the emails now that you're sending out, a lot of your companies may have asked that you specify at the bottom of the email what your preferred pronouns are, just as an example, right? I can tell you, I know godly people who comply with that, and I know godly people who say, I would never comply with that, right? Because it's kind of a tricky thing, right? It it depends on how you're kind of viewing it and what you're thinking is behind that. Let me just kind of say this, compliance can be a slippery slope. The subsequent requests for compliance don't tend to get easier. When we comply with one thing, the next thing that comes along is not going to be easier than the first one. That's typically how it works, right? And it's tricky even for myself as a pastor, I have to be honest, even discussing these kinds of things. I try to follow the advice of R.C. Sproul. Sproul, sorry, I had a professor named Sproul, so I always say it's Sproul. It's R.C. Sproul. He once warned that we must tread very carefully when dealing with the conscience, whether it's our own conscience or the conscience of other people. And I really agree with what he says. Look at this statement. I think it's, it's brilliant. He says, when we impose false guilt on others, we paralyze our neighbors, binding them in chains where God has left them free. I don't want to do that to anyone here by telling you how you should manage this. He says, also, when we urge false innocence, we contribute to their delinquency, exposing them to the judgment of God. I don't want to do that either. I don't want to just not talk about some of this stuff and not force you to think about it and you just kind of go down the garden path with whatever's happening. And so I also live with this tension when I speak to you guys about these things. Here's the best advice that I can give you. Inform your conscience with the word of God, and with the Spirit of God, all right? Get to know your Bible, study your Bible, and then pray and ask the Spirit of God to illuminate you when it comes to these kinds of decisions and the things that you choose to do. Like I said, I don't want to burden you needlessly, but neither do I want to see you fall into judgment. And here's the deal, guys. I don't face the same challenges that many of you face. My workplace is pretty good with this, (laughs) right? We're still not using preferred pronouns in our emails. Um, But I know it's hard for some of you. I know it's hard. I know people, even in our church, that have left their jobs in the last couple of years because of these kinds of things. And I want you to know, I I know what you're going through, and I pray for you in this. Because this is difficult. And the temperature's getting turned up on a lot of this stuff. And I know a lot of you are facing this kind of stuff on a daily basis. It's tough. I pray for you. Well, the Hebrew midwives stood their ground and they disobeyed. For them, this was pretty clear what they had to do in this situation. 
And when Pharaoh sees that they're letting the male babies live, he says, time for a little meeting, and he calls them in. They give a very unlikely and somewhat unbelievable reason for what's taking place. The Hebrew women are so hardy and strong that they give birth before the midwives can get there. Right? And Pharaoh's like, come on. Right? Come on. What's happening here? This is what we call the principle of the higher moral good. And you need to understand this is, this is a real thing. Sometimes an act that is normally a sin is not considered such when it is done for an immediate greater good. And sometimes Christians are not aware of this. Sometimes we talk about the ends never justify the means, right? In general, that's true. In general, the ends don't justify the means. But there is this principle of the higher moral good. Another example that we see in scripture where this is employed is by Rahab. Remember? The book of Joshua. Rahab lied about the spies being hidden in her home. She was doing it to save their lives. And in Hebrews chapter 11, she is commended for doing it. Right? So she lied, but she was commended for it because it was for the higher moral good of protecting human life. A person hiding Jews in their home was right to lie to the Nazis when they came looking, don't you think? Yeah. So I love verse 20. These midwives were wise and they were committed to doing what was right. And so as as in verse 20, so God dealt well with the midwives. We don't know exactly what that means. But God sees your acts of courage, guys, and he rewards them. So in those moments where you have to step up and make a difficult decision, understand God sees and he will reward you. I've heard so many stories of Christians who left a job for moral reasons only to be blessed even more. To be be afraid, say, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't stay here. I got to go somewhere else. And God gives them something even better. I've seen so many stories that God will take care of you if you make those hard decisions. Now notice it says, That not only did the Israelites continue to multiply after this, but God blessed the midwives with families, it says. That is so cool. Now, for quite some time, my wife was looking into midwifery. Doesn't that sound evil? Anyway, um, (laughs) it sounds like they're mixing potions or something, right? But legitimate thing, right? She was looking into this, so I understand the whole process and stuff. I also understand there are a lot of women that become midwives because they themselves can't have kids. It's just a thing. Because they love children, and not being able to have children, that would be a terrible, terrible thing for a woman that wants them. And so they become midwives so they can be right there and just like be right in the mess, right, of bringing babies into the world. And I think to myself, what a cool thing for God to do here, right, for these midwives. He gave them the ability to have families, some of them. Pretty cool, right? God will reward you for making difficult decisions, and he will give you what your heart really desires, the good part of your heart, your true and pure desires. Well, he gave them the richest blessing that they could ever hope for, a family of their own. As the band comes up, we're going to wrap it up. Pharaoh was frustrated of course, and what all frustrated leaders do, rather than getting creative in their thinking, they just double down on the same strategy that they've had. He commands all of the people to obey his new edict. We're going to bypass the midwives. They're not working. They're not helping us. So everybody now, we're calling on everybody. If you see a Hebrew baby boy, kill him. If you see one being born, kill that baby. Throw the baby into the Nile River. That was what the edict was. So now Pharaoh, he's going to use the strategy of snitches and crocodiles. We could call this strategy. It's the new snitches and crocodiles edict. You snitch, we'll throw the baby into the river and the crocs will eat them up. Problem solved. And the stage is now set for one of the most important figures of history to come along. Closing thought. Before today, I'm guessing that many of you did not know the names Shifra and Pua. How many would be so honest as to admit it, right? You've read the story, but if I had to say, who are those two people, right? Their legacy was actually cemented in Scripture by Moses himself under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you realize that? Because of the courageous stand that they took. Heroes of faith and courage who chose to fear God 
rather than men. And next week, we're going to meet the greatest fruit of their labor and a man named Moses. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this study. Thank you for this book. We pray that you would really bless it and use it over these upcoming weeks. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us on Sundays at 4 p.m. for our weekly service at 7755 10th Line North, Mississauga. Or visit renewchurch.ca slash connect for more information about how you can get connected at Renew Church.